Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the Word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, the Amplified, he says, May the Lord direct your hearts in two, he says, realizing and showing the love of God into the steadfastness and patience of Christ and in waiting for his return. He says, may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God. May he direct your hearts into the love of God. This is Paul praying for the church of Thessalonica. He says, may God direct your hearts into the love of God. May he direct your hearts into the love of God. Into the love of God. May your hearts understand the love of God. But the order given here, one, that you come to the realization and the showing. Because you cannot show what is not realized. You cannot reveal what is not revealed. You cannot demystify what is not demystified. You cannot express what is not experienced. You cannot give what has not been given, what you've not received. And so here he's telling us the order of things. And I tell people that the Bible is the Bible of order. Lately, um, the Lord was dealing with me touching the spirit of revelation and he asked me a very fundamental question and that I would like to pose to you because for many years of history we are trying to interpret the Bible and even though you go through the different faiths, the evangelicals, Pentecostals, Charismatics, whatever you want to call any new denomination, when we are discussing the authority of scripture it's something we all agree with we all agree in the authority of scripture that we believe that the word of god is the authority by which we run life and the christian faith but then when we get down to the nitty-gritty of discussing what the authority of scripture is in detail we have different ideas about what it means and so i'm almost thinking what is scripture what is truth Research has proved that now the born-again faith has more than a thousand denominations within and they are breaking within, some in different countries, some in different continents and all of these are breaking because of doctrine in how everybody interprets what they think the word means. And the Lord has told me, he said, that this is the problem, it's because you are trying to interpret what I did not call you to interpret. God has not called us to interpret the word. God gave us the word and he has interpreted it by the Spirit. He called us simply to teach what he has interpreted. This is the difference between men interpreting the word and God himself interpreting the word. He says you shall receive the Spirit and the Spirit of God, the Bible says, he shall teach you all things and remind you that which you have forgotten. So I believe that the primary ministry of the Holy Spirit is for the interpretation of the word of God not us to interpret it but God to interpret it to us by the Holy Spirit that when we are giving we are giving what is already interpreted and that's why I understand now that the spirit of revelation is the spirit that opens the word to you in its most interpreted form hallelujah and so we are seeking the interpretation of things as they are already interpreted by scripture and so even when I touch love I am persuaded that not everybody understands love in the way God has given it and even as I'm giving I will sound like I'm interpreting but really I'm simply relaying what is already interpreted by scripture I don't know if you understand what I'm saying and so today we have a different idea of love okay and that is why when God defines his love he seeks to define the order in Luke chapter 1 Verse 1, as they delivered them and to us too from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. And he says, and it seemed good to me also, he says, having had perfect understanding of these things, 
that I might minister or write or speak of these very things from the very first, okay, as I write to you, O dear Theophilus. In other words, there is an order in the writing of Scripture. There is an order in the things of God. Certain things come first, okay? The realization, the understanding of the love of God precedes the showing of it. If you show what is not realized, if you break that order and you're trying to give a love that is not revealed, you're out of the order of the Spirit. And no matter how beautiful that love is, it's not the love of God. It's not agape. Praise God. And so in this order, he's calling us firstly to the realization. And then after the realization, then we give. And so I'm going to take time to teach on the realization for some time. And then I'll give then how we show. It is easy for you to show when you get to the realization. The world is dark, okay? The world is full of darkness. God called us out of darkness into a marvelous light. But the world lies in darkness and wickedness, the Bible says. The prince of this world is roaming the world. The effect of modernism or modernity in our generation, it has gotten to a place where we even question whether we are human beings or not. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. We're not even sure whether we are male or female anymore. You understand what I'm saying? And that's how dark the world has become. We don't even understand what a family is anymore. We don't even understand what life is. The younger generation doesn't even know how to do life. They don't even know the order of human life. It's dark in the world. In the world, I add, in the world. Okay? And so we see that if you go back time in history and now, wickedness has continued to manifest in degrees beyond our words can articulate, beyond our thoughts can express. There's a lot of wickedness in the world. And because of that, people are living in hopelessness. People are living in despair. People are living in depression. People are living in pain. People are living in frustration. There's a man right now paying millions of dollars to save his life. And his son goes to hospital and tells the doctor, I'll give you any amount of money to save my father. And on the same planet, there's a young boy at the age of 15 who has bought pills in his bedroom and he's going to take it and kill himself. Because that's how the world is. There's one fighting for life and there's another one who does not want to live anymore. They're tired of the world, they're tired of people. They're tired of situations, they're tired of circumstances, and then they give themselves over to many things that will give them life. Okay? Young boys and girls are doing drugs and alcohol, and, you know, they get high all the time just to excuse themselves from a world that they can't explain and interpret in their own understanding. The things that are happening around them are so fast for them that they cannot cope, and they're turning to different addictions and things that are destroying their lives. And you look at some and they are living but they look dead. They are dead within, they are empty. And then they are inventing and innovating things that will give them joy and these things are creating more pain. And that's the essence of why now we have conversations on the table of postmodernity. What has been the effect of this modern society? Because now it has put damages on people and people don't even know anymore how to live. It was easy to fight a terrorist years ago. How do you fight a person with a bottle on the streets and is trying to fight for his freedom? What is in the young man who wakes up every morning to go on that street and risk his life to die? And students fall out of school because they don't have anything to live for. They don't have anything to live for. They don't have anything to live for. Go to southern Sudan and see the age of children who are dressed in armed combat and are carrying guns. 14, 13 years old. They are taught to fight at that age. They don't even know why they are killing, but they are. Because the world is hopeless. It's what the world is. And newsflash, it will continue like that because that's the world. It's prophesied. No prayer can change that. Our responsibility is to get men out of that darkness and bring them to light through the glorious gospel. 
The only way these scales can change is if we bring men to the saving knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That they might have a life, that that emptiness might be filled with something better, with something higher. Somebody shout hallelujah. But also we are even dealing with Christians who do not know, who are still frustrated by the pressures of this world. Okay? And because of that, some are dealing with many things, they're drinking, they're wasting their bodies in many things. Why? Because there's something that is not revealed yet to them. And it's that thing I want to give you this morning. Okay? A story is told of a man and his fellow was a drunkard. Okay? And so as he was driving, drunk, he sees policemen stopping people. Yeah, for drunk and driving, right? And uh, his niece uh, used to come to this church. So when he sees this policeman stop him, he tries to even run through the barricade and try to knock it. But somehow was not successful. Eventually, I think he hit sort of a ravine and he could not drive any further. So they get him out. They put him under the lights to what? To check him. You know how they get those lights on you and then you walk in a straight line and stuff and the guy could not balance. And so he had found another guy who had been um, arrested there again on the scene and then another car came coming. And then this guy also came and he tried to drive and then they tried to chase the other fellow. And so when they ran to get to this guy also who was drunk that night because drunk men sometimes want to doze yeah? and drive off. So they now try to attend to the other fellow also, who had also sort of driven badly. And so when they run to attend to this guy, this guy gets the idea, get in the car and drive away. Okay. So he gets in the car and does what? Drives away, the police never follow, he goes to bed very early in the morning. So next day, the police are on his gate. Do, 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 do. Uh -huh. Can we see the boss of his house? Who lives here? Who is the boss? He's in bed. Call him for us. Last night we arrested you. You were drunk. And you drove away. And left us on the scene. We've come to arrest you. Says me. I returned home at 8 p.m. He said. Ask my houseboy. What can the houseboy say? He says, yeah, he was here at 8. Are you sure? Yes. Do you have any other proof? I told him, take us to your garage. So a guy takes him to his garage. He had stolen the policeman's car. When he was drunk, when he got drunk, eh, his brain didn't tell the difference between his car and the police car. Because the police car had lights for him, he just got that one hand. <laughs> so he sends the niece and tells him, tell Apostle Grace to pray for me because I, I have more problems than you can imagine. It's one thing that I'm drinking, but how could I steal a police car? Praise God. People have issues. People have what? Issues. But you see, it's because there are places that are empty that only certain things we feel can feel, but those are temporary fixes. They're not eternal. They're not permanent. Hallelujah. It's because some people have not tried God. They've not been drunk on God. Hallelujah. They've not been drunk on the Holy Spirit. They have not experienced the drunkenness of the Holy Ghost. And that's the essence of us understanding what the love of God is. That's why we need to teach it. Because the world is full of hate. The world is full of hate. I mean, I feel I need a word bigger than hate. The world is evil. Praise God. And so sometimes God calls us to go back to really understand who we are as human beings, who we are as children of the Most High God, who we are as His own offspring, who we are and how we were made, what it took Him to make you. You would learn to treasure yourself. You'd learn to place a value on you. Praise God. You've learned to place a certain value on you. Some people are like animals. They sell themselves even cheaper than the price of animals. Because what the devil has done is he has taken away their self-esteem, their identity and who they are. They no longer know who they are. 
and the love of God gives us identity. Somebody shout hallelujah. The Bible says in Psalms 139 verses 13, give me the KJV of that. He says that for thou hast possessed my reins and thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. In other words, he possessed you even in your mother's womb. You were an article, you were a substance, you were a piece even in your mother's womb. You were not just a small little thing that was being neat by the order of biology and nature. No. Even in there, God sort of had a certain understanding of who you are. He knew you. The message Bible says, you shaped me. He says, you shaped me in the inside and then out and you formed me in my mother's womb. And the 14th verse says, I thank you, my high God. He says, you're breathtaking. He says, body and soul, he says, I am marvelously made. He says, when I look at myself and I see the time God took to make me, the psalmist understood how marvelous he was. The Bible says, for you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Do you know what that means? It means God just didn't wake up and just put something. It's just, you're saying, you understand. In high school, <laughs> there was a fellow, you know how boys beat each other. They just love to throw jokes at one another. And then this guy looks at his friend and says, it seems for you when God was throwing some parts, <laughs> he threw some part on you that he was not some... You understand? There are people who think that God simply just... No, God took time on you. Are you hearing me? If there's a spiritual compass and contractor and ruler, God used the ruler on you. Hallelujah. But what if I have this big and what that bigger? That's exactly what I'm trying to tell you. That's God's art. He was as artistic enough. Whether your nose is smaller or mine is bigger, you're that beautiful. He says you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Are you hearing me? But people are punishing themselves, going through, you know, for guys to change their body parts. I see women on television. One time half the nose was like this. The next time you see the picture, the nose is like this. I'm like, what in the world? You understand? But why? Why are they trying to shape themselves? It is because Satan has given them an image of what they should supposedly look like. And they do not have an idea of who they are in God. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Women, don't add other parts. Eh? Some women, you're here, God put a ruler. Because he wanted you straight, are you hearing me? And then you get things and then you start packing yourself. Because then you start working. Why? Why should you do that? You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Men, let me ask you men. Do we marry hips? Answer me. Do we marry that? Do we marry bigger? No. What do we marry? Rabba katala paye ketelepa. Somebody said hallelujah. That's what we marry. If a woman knows God a certain way, are you hearing me? This can become that. Why? What are you talking about? Because beauty lies in the eye of the beholder. Seek God. Put yourself together in God. You'll be amazed at the beauty you will carry. How many people have everything but they don't have everything? Tell your neighbor I'm okay the way I am. Black women love your color. Love it. I love being this dark. I don't regret carrying this color. Uh-uh. No. When I stand in the sun, there's the way I feel. Hallelujah. Fearfully and wonderfully made. I love my hair, the Kaweke one. I love it the way it is. Are you hearing me? Praise God. Somebody shout hallelujah. Because when I look at myself, I'm like, eh, hey, God, you're artistic. Sometimes I shock myself in the mirror and I'm like, why? Because I have to do this. I got to do this. He says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You are wonderful. You are wonderful. I said, you are wonderful. And the Bible says, marvelous are thy works. You're marvelous. You are okay. Don't add, no, you are okay. No, why should you? What are you looking for? Let me tell you, Christian, you are what you see. If you go in that mirror and you feel 
You're ugly. You are. But if you go in that mirror and you feel like, yeah, you are. He says we were like grasshoppers to them and so were we in their sight. Did you see that? We were like grasshoppers and so were we, the Bible says, in their sight. It means when we saw ourselves as grasshoppers, the Philistines saw us as grasshoppers. That means if you see yourself ugly, we see you ugly. Are you hearing me? Even the people who you see are okay, they are cutting themselves every day. Yeah? Plastic surgeons are now becoming the richest thing in the world. There was a young man I saw on a program and he went that they would um, give him um, plastic packs, right? And the guy had been injected for so long and they told him his body could not take it in. And this guy is interviewed after the doctors tell him that we can't work on you. He says, I'll look for other doctors to do it because he was too desperate to be something God has not created him to be. And let me tell you, those people who go down on those surgeon nights to change their noses and ears and eyes, they will never be satisfied of themselves. What they are trying to fix here is what's inside. And they think that by fixing here, they'll feel better here. Listen, when somebody's ugly here, it doesn't matter how much beauty you put on them. You understand what I'm saying? God has not called you to change your shape. He has not called you to change your shape. Oh, what if I have a big nose? There's someone who is looking for that one. And the day you change it, you'll miss your opportunity. If somebody shout amen. Love who you are. Tall or short, small or big, love who you are. Don't be intimidated. Don't be intimidated. You are fearfully, your God's masterpiece. You are his piece of art. Somebody say hallelujah. And the 15th verse says, you know me inside out. He has not only shaped and molded you into this wonderful thing. He knows you inside and he knows you out. This God cares to know everything that touches your life. He knows you. Oh, but you know what? People don't understand me. Yes, people cannot and will not understand you, but this God understands you. What a God. What a God. He understands you. He understands you. Have you ever been in a situation where you want to be understood and nobody understands you? Yes. But God says, even when they don't understand you, I know. I know what you need. I know how you need it. I know how you want to receive it. And I will do it exactly because I know you. I mean, when he says, I'll give your heart's desires, do you know what that means? Whatever you define in your spirit as beauty and desired, God knows it and he will give you exactly. He knows us. He knows the kind of children you need. He will not give you any other child. He knows the kind of spouse you need. He will not give you any other child. He knows the kind of pastor you need. He can't give you any other. He knows everything. <laughs> Praise God. Somebody shout hallelujah. Glory to God. He knows the car you will drive. He knows the ministry that you will build. He knows the anointing you admire. He knows the gifting. He knows you in and out. And the Bible says, he will know every bone in my body. Oh! Okay, this is the anatomy of a man. This is the figure of a man, the skeleton of a man. That's a bone of a man. No, he says, I know even your particular bone. If they were all broken in valleys, and they're all thrown in one place, I would still piece out your finger in the millions and say, this is clear. Somebody shout hallelujah. And the Bible says, you know exactly how I was what? I was made 
bit by bit. The Bible uses the word sculpted from nothing into something. That means like a sculptor makes, okay? He molded you. He took time on you. He went around your ears. He made sure. I mean, that's just how much God loves you. You're his masterpiece. Somebody shout hallelujah. Verse 16, he says, like an open book, you watched me grow from conception to birth. Like an open book. In other words, from the time your father's sperm met your mom's egg, God was like this. Wow. What if you're a product of a mistake? Yes, you're a product of a mistake, but you are not a mistake. Do you understand what I'm saying? You might be a product of a mistake, but you the product, you're not a word. A mistake. He knew it. And the Bible says he started looking at you like a book. Like he started observing from the time that sperm met that egg. He was observing. He was observing. Are you hearing me? Of the millions of sperm that swam that day, for you his eye was on you. <laughs> He was following. He was following the creation. He possessed you in your mother's womb. You know what it means possessed? The literal Hebrew word there for possessed is fenced you in. That means when this conception took place, he put his hand around you like this. And like, ah, this one. Other spams die, but this particular one has to make it into the world of men. Somebody shout hallelujah. Glory to God. Shout hallelujah. And the Bible says, all the stages of my life were spread out before you. The days of my life all prepared before I'd even lived. He says, your thoughts, how rare, how beautiful. He says, I'll never comprehend them. He says, the thoughts that you have toward me, they are amazing. They are beautiful. That means God is thinking about you. His thoughts towards you are amazing. And the next verse says, so if I could begin to count those thoughts any more than I could count the sun on the seashore. In other words, if God is to get the thoughts that he has towards you, you need to get the sand on the seashore and count it. Each sand representing a thought. I always say that, but I pray people get it. I pray it gets out of your mind and gets into your spirit to walk and see this word as I'm speaking, it, to understand what it means for God to think about you that much. He's thinking about you every time, every day of your life, every minute and every hour of your being. He is thinking about you. He says, for I know the thoughts that I have towards you. And he even gives you a clue of these thoughts. He says, those thoughts are to make you prosperous and not to harm you. That's how much I love you. He says, they are thoughts of peace and not of evil. And he says, and I want to give you an expected end. Like, you muse him every day. He sits there and just watches you like this. And then he starts saying, wow, look at him. Look at him walking. Look at your shoe. Look at you. Look at you. You're just the thing he's thinking about every other day. And then you wake up and take poison and die. God loves him enough to keep him in spite of whatever diseases could be in his body. How many healthy people are dying today? God can keep you. And he will keep you. And the Bible says, choose life and death today. Choose. Choose. He says life and death are in the power of the tongue. Choose. You choose. Choose now. Choose. I choose life. I said I choose life. I choose to live. Yes, say it with your mouth. Say I choose to live. It's a choice. Life has no power. Death has no power. He says life and death are in the power of the tongue. I choose life. I choose life. I choose life. I've been in a hospital bed and they told me I had days to live. I've been there. And I chose life. I said I choose life. And just to see how this starts to shape up and your body starts to respond. What a God. 
What a God. Somebody shout amen. So he says, if I should count them, they would be like the sand on the seashore. In other words, we cannot count the thoughts that God has over us. In Psalm 56, verses 8, the message version, he says, you've kept track of every toss and turn through my sleepless night. That means even in the days when you lost sleep and you turned like this, he says, my daughter's turned. Even in the times when you lost peace and sat up, he took record of it. Somebody shout hallelujah. And the Bible says each tear, each, each, each tear entered my ledger. He recorded anything that ever made you weep. He recorded it down. And the Bible says and each ache is written in his book. In other words, even when you get disappointed and you call someone, and they don't answer your call. God gets a pen. <laughs> it pains God. It pains Him. Even the small things that break your heart. Even things that break your heart in your ignorance. He can start by saying, she's stupid, comma, but she's hurting. It pains God even in our stupidity. Even in our foolishness, it pains him when we hurt. You know, I'm teaching these things, but I pray that you get to understand what I'm trying to say here. Because the things they read before us, but many of us don't have the understanding, the full apprehension. He says he has kept track of everything that you have done. The next step you're going to do, he is there. He's watching everything. He has not lost sight of you. Somebody shout amen. amen. Matthew 10, 29. He says, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. He says, But the very hairs of your head are all... He even separates the one which was put on and the one which you really have. And he tells you... <laughs> what a God! Somebody shout amen. amen. He says, even the very hairs of your head, they are all numbered. All numbered. All numbered. All numbered. They are all numbered. They are all numbered. They are all numbered. How much hair is on your head? I don't know. But God knows even what fell off when you were brushing your hair this morning. He counted it. One, two, three. He just fell off. He just fell off. He took the record. And all of us here, even those whose hair just fell off without brushing, he counted. By biological reasons, he counted. Even that hair that sprouted out this morning, he says, that one has come too. Oh! What a God! Somebody shout Amen. Shout Amen. And that is why in the 31st verse it says, Fear ye not therefore. Don't fear. I love you. Don't be afraid. I love you. I love you. I love you. I do. Don't be afraid. I love you. I love you. Oh, but this is happening. Yes, but I love you more than that thing. And because I love you, I'll see you there. I'll see you through that. Somebody shout hallelujah. Jeremiah chapter 1 verses 5. Read the Amplified. He says, before I formed you in the womb. I love the way the Amplified says it. He adds and says, I knew and approved of you as my chosen instrument. I knew before you were formed. I knew and I had approved of you as my... You are approved of God. So what if they think you're fake? Just their thoughts. God approves of you. So what if they don't love you and they reject you? Yes, that's their fault. God loves and approves of you. He has made you a chosen instrument. And the Bible says that before you were born, I separated and set you apart. And I consecrated you and I appointed you as a prophet to nations, not a survivor in Uganda. Hey! Tell your neighbor I'm a voice to the world. He called you. Have a voice. I don't care whether you stand on this pulpit. You are a prophet to the nations. 
You might be a businessman. May through your business, God make you a prophetic voice. May through your engineering, God make you a prophetic voice. May through your career, God make you a prophetic voice. Whatever God has called you to be, He has called you for that and that's all you can be and not otherwise. That's love. It is love that when He created you, He didn't just put you on the world to survive. He even planned for you the life that you should live, the way that you should end, to handle your expectation and put it in you and then seek to give you your expected end. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the love of God. What a love. Tell your neighbor, what a love. And then you became born again. It even became all. You received him as your Lord and Savior. That even now changed the narrative. He said in Isaiah 43, with you I can even give other nations for you. I'll give nations for you. Are you hearing me? Because I'm your God and the Holy One of your Savior, I paid, he says, a huge price for you. He said, all of Egypt with rich Kush Siba, they were all thrown in there. It's one of those prices. He looks at the whole nation and he says, uh-uh, let it go. And says, because you're precious in my sight and honored, God honors me. He said, and because I love you, he says, I will give men in return of you. Because you're mine, I love you that much. Not because I don't love them, but I love you more because you know me. Are you hearing me? You have believed me. You have received me. It might be unfair. Yes, God loves people, but the love he has for the believer. John said, behold what manner of love that God has bestowed upon us. The Bible says that we should be called the sons of God. Yes, he loves the world, but he loves us more. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout amen. In Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 17, he says, I the Lord who is in the midst of you, the Amplified says, he will rejoice over you with joy. He will rest in silent satisfaction in his love that is toward you. He will be silent and make no mention, the Bible says, of past sins or even recall them. Why? Because he loves you. He says, I love you so much that even when you come, I don't think about what you did to me. I refuse to recall, I refuse to mention because I love you. And the Bible says, and he will exalt over you with singing. He will rejoice over you with singing. That means some of us must understand, the love he has toward us gets so overwhelming that he starts creating songs over you. Grace Lubega, Grace Lubega. And then Apostle Paul is like, you can put your name. Then it comes at night when you're sleeping and then you're like, I love you. I love you. I love you. Oh my God. He, oh my God. He sings over you. He loves you so much that he can't just mention it. He even puts it in song. Now leave these songs for men who they sing for women. That's nothing. Those ones sing and then they divorce the next day. This one, he said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. Somebody shout, Amen. Say glory to God. And the Bible says in John chapter 10, 28, it says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. He says, and neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. No man can pluck you. No man can pluck you. No man can pluck you. When you're in his hand, he's like this. He holds you like this. Are you hearing me? Why? Because he knows that he loves you. He would rather die than lose you. And that's the expression that he gives through Christ Jesus. He says, you know what? To lose you, I would rather die. He came in the flesh. For in Christ, the Bible says, dwelt all the fullness of God bodily. And then he shed his blood at the cross for you because he loves you. He says, I would rather die. You remember that song? God loves people more than anything. God loves people more than anything. More than anything he wants them to know. He'd rather die than let them go. Cause God loves me. 
Lord. Sing it one more time and say, God loves people. God loves people more than anything. God loves people more than The message Bible says, I would tread creation for you. That's what the message Bible says. It says, I would tread nations for you. If you say, this is the world, this is everything God has created, and then they put you here, God would say, uh uh, that all can melt and I'll take you. I'll choose you any day. He'll choose you over any buildings any day. He'll choose you over any creation, even the most beautiful pieces of creations of the earth. He says, I will choose you over them any day. Is how much God loves you. You must realize it. Your spirit must understand this. Your spirit must understand this. In Ephesians, he says that I pray that you may really come to know practically through experience for yourselves he says the love of Christ and he says that this love and experience surpasses mere knowledge without experience so it's one thing to say yes Jesus loves me because the Bible tells me so I know he loves me because they say it but it's one thing to go beyond the saying and the mere knowledge that God loves you it's another thing when God switches you into the experience of his love he says that you may be filled listen through all your being and to all the fullness of God. In other words, when you learn to experience, when you get to the place of the experience that goes beyond the knowledge, God fills you. God fills you. And the Bible says that you may be filled through all your being and to all the fullness of God and that you may have, he says, the richest measure of the divine presence and you will become a body wholly filled and flooded with God himself. That's what love can do. Why are men going on prayer mountains to ask for the anointing? Why don't men just fall in love with him? Why are men spending countless hundreds of years just fasting to get power? Why don't they just fast and be with him? Why don't you create a life of relating with God and simply just sit in your room and just say, Ruba kara bakusha kara. And just receive his love. Because he says that's the thing that opens the richest measure of the divine presence of their man. The anointing is activated by the power of love. Somebody shout hallelujah. As a believer, yes, I knew Jesus loved me because the Bible tells me so. And one day, I'll never forget that day. We had gone out praying. I was conscious of God's love. But I remember the day he finally came in an experience and told me, let me love you. I felt something that even the word love has no power to define. Ladies and gentlemen, the love of God can become an experience. You can experience him firsthand. You can feel him. He knows how to touch you. He knows how to love you. I had an experience for minutes. And when I come out of it, there was nothing in this world that I could compare to desire like that experience. He placed an experience on me. He hugged me. I felt his arms open toward me like this and just held me in his arms like that. And I could feel the love of God. 
and heaven opened over me. I could see heaven. I saw, you know, the cherubim. Literally, heaven was open before me. I was like in the heavenly realm. I could see everything that was surrounding me. And I understood that the atmosphere of heaven is love. Like we breathe oxygen here, the true atmosphere of heaven is love. Nobody can define it. Even the Greek word agape. It tries to tell us it's the love which God has in himself, but it doesn't tell us exactly what that love is. Because when the man of the spirit goes there, he says, no, God is love. That's all he can say. This is something that you have to experience for your own self. Somebody shout amen. And then the next thing I know, I felt a presence over my life. And then they gave me the Bible I was supposed to minister that day. And I opened the Bible and as I started to read the lines, the power of God hit the place. By the time I looked, literally no man was standing. The anointing of God lingered on that ground the whole evening, the whole night and the next day. Because I had encountered a certain love. And I realized that where love is, you don't seek the anointing, the presence, the divine presence, the measure of God in its richest form comes on you and you start to feel the presence of God around everything you could feel him as you feel yourself even more than you feel yourself it's a reality no one can ever give you until you ever get to that experience that's what Paul is saying he says that you may experience for yourselves the love of God the love of God the love of God that was the door to the miraculous I understood why when he's moved with compassion he heals the sick. That was the door to the demonstration of power. I was convinced finally why he gives all his children liberally. He says, he that did not withhold the son, will he not with him give you all things freely? I understood why God provides. I understood why the gifts of the Spirit flow through us. I understood why the anointing flows with certain men differently from others. Because certain men have touched a certain dimension of God's love. And when you get in touch with that dimension, you don't need to pray. You just stretch your hand and the power of God moves. Because that's what the anointing does. You are a carrier of the divine presence of God. It might scare, it might intimidate, but that's them who don't know God. But when you have God, His Spirit is ever present. His anointing is with you. The lamb of the blind see the sick are healed. Why? Because it's the presence, the measure of the anointing of God. And that's what our generation is missing. Our generation is too politically correct and liberally right that it has disconnected from their first law. We want generations where you don't need to tell people to pray anymore. Why? Because that love compels you. Are you hearing me? You find yourself locking yourself up. You don't need to talk to anybody. Nobody needs to tell you to pray. You find yourself locked up in a room saying, Father, Rika Paraba. The Bible says, in the bliss of whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit of God expressing love and receiving love from God. That symbiotic thing that you share with God. That's the thing that gives you confidence that cancer cannot kill you. That's the thing that gives you confidence that HIV cannot kill you. That's the thing that gives you confidence that your children will not fail. That's the anointing that gives you confidence that God has a plan over your life that is bigger than men can ever imagine. Yes, you can be hated. Yes, you can be rejected. Yes, men can judge you. Men will never understand you. But when you have him, One woman sang, in your fullness I will wait. I find my peace beneath the cross. Knowing you, my one desire. Take me now to win. Boundless love, come, come.
one day I was very disappointed and hurt by somebody, an individual. They hurt me. They broke me. They did something to me that was so painful and not only brought damage to my heart but brought damage to the ministry. One individual. And I remember voices in my ears telling me this is coming to an end you're destroyed because I've heard I was broken I did not know how to bleed and yet preach love I didn't know and this was not an attack on me only but on the ministry too because you see when we're men of God everything spoken is true to people where everything spoken about us is true and I remember I was driving from home and Jesus came in that car and he looked at me I knew he was there he was there because I've had experiences with him I know when Christ is with me and he just appeared here and then he turned to me as I was driving and then he said I love you I love you I called you and because of this he said I will uphold you you will never fail and then he departed I remember coming to a funeral meeting I just worshipped through before I said he preached but the worship I was giving was not really the worship you lead people into as you're going to preach no it was a worship of gratitude of a voice that had assured me of how much he loved me and I went through it and immediately after that experience even the person who had me I felt I loved him because I saw them for who they really are they were frail human victims that Satan had deluded into a world of destroying more and just to know that they could not destroy me just to know that God loved me sometimes all you need to know is that God loves you that's why he says you shall not be afraid you cannot pray without this love if you do, you'll be out of duty and not out of a relationship. Some of you who have received this love, you're not even struggling to fast. There is no desire for food because you desire one more because we want him so badly. That thing changes your closet. You understand why the Bible says shut the door. You understand why now the Bible says now shut the door and speak to your father which is in secret. Because nobody can define that place with you and God. It's a love affair. It doesn't matter how long we spend there. Sometimes I sit in this prison two or three hours and I just bust that. I say, God, I'm here. Sometimes I don't even have words to tell him. I was a hard guy, but sometimes I find myself weeping. Not because I want to cry, but it's overwhelming me. And then he ministers to my spirit. And I know that this is love. This is love. This is love. I want you to just love on God. Just love on God. Just receive his love. Allow him to minister to you. The mystery. Oh, 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 oh,
a mighty hand clap of praise. Thank you for the love that he has toward you. And I pray that may we come to the full realization of God's love towards us and what he has done for us. We receive his love. We receive his love. We receive the experiences of his love. We fully receive the realizations of his love. Holy Spirit, you minister to us in ways beyond what can do. And you hang us, you hang us, you establish us with the love of God. Give the Lord a mighty hand of a praise. Come on, clap for love, celebrate love. Celebrate love. He loves us in spite of our weaknesses, in spite of who we are, in spite of what we can do, in spite. God loves men. God loves men. Thank you, Lord. That is the God 
who tells you do not be afraid. Don't be afraid for your house. Don't be afraid concerning your ministry. Don't be afraid concerning your work, your job, and those that frustrate you and speak evil of you and spite you. Don't be afraid. He loves you and he knows you inside and out. Never seek to vindicate yourself before men. Even when it hurts most, the one that knows you will. Because he is with you. He's the present help in time of need. The friend that sticks closer than a brother. We can trust God. You're sick in your body, receive your healing now. Whatever is going out of line, receive your deliverance now. Just mention your need right now. And receive the answer now. In Jesus' name. And if you're here and you have never received the manner of love to be called a son, you have never given your life to Jesus. You say, I'm not born again, but tonight I have had the message and I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. You're going to repeat these words after me. Say, Jesus, tonight I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I receive love. I believe that you died for my sins and was raised for my glory. Tonight, I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. Change my life. Feel me. Reveal yourself to me. In Jesus' name. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Sinero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at sinerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.sinero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at UMA Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Make manifest.